the DOPE Organizing Committee is excited to present Dr. Kim Tallbear to the DOPE as the DOPE 2015 keynote speaker. Though Dr. Tallbear does not define herself as a political ecologist, much of her work speaks to issues central to political ecological inquiry, particularly the intersection of techno-science, the environment, culture, and governance. As you all know by now from sessions and our other events this weekend, DOPE is an exceptionally interdisciplinary conference. So it should be no surprise that Dr. Tallbear's background and research is similarly interdisciplinary. A member of the Sesaton Wapitan Oyote, uh, Kim was raised by three generations of women in her family. Kim, for, excuse me, Kim first trained to be a community and environmental planner at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and MIT which prepared her to work on projects concerning tribal government interest in nuclear waste management. This work led to questions about the culture and politics of science and technology, resulting in a return to academia, where she earned a PhD from University of California at Santa Cruz in history of consciousness, where she worked with uh, James Clifford and Donna Haraway on her dissertation, which explored the concept of Native American DNA as an object of human population genetics research. Since then, since her graduation, Kim has worked at Arizona State University at Tempe in the Department of American Indian Studies, at UC Berkeley in both Gender and Women's Studies and in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy, and Management. In 2008, she was hired as an assistant professor in the, uh, of science, technology, and environmental policy in that same department. In 2013, she accepted a position as associate professor of anthropology and Native American and indigenous studies at Texas, University of Texas at Austin, after a year as a Donald D. Harrington Fellow in anthropology. She studies the ways in which genetic science is co-constituted with notions of race and indigeneity. And has her most recently published book, Native American DNA, Tribal Belonging and the False Promise of Genetic Science, explores these issues, looking at the historical and ongoing roles of science and technology, or technoscience, in the colonization of indigenous peoples and others. More recently, Kim has also become interested in the overlap between constructions of nature and sexuality. She has published in many academic journals, including Social Studies of Science, the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics, and the International Journal of Cultural Property. Kim has advised tribal and other indigenous governmental organizations, federal agencies, science museums, and genome researchers and policymakers on issues to indigenous peoples, science, and technology. Her use of indigenous, post-colonial, and feminist science studies analyses enables not only critique, but generative thinking about the possibilities for democratizing science and technology. So please come together and help me welcome Dr. Kimberly Tallbear to this stage. Good evening. I'm just going to mark my time here and then I'll get started. Okay. Well, thank you um, for the invitation to be with you here tonight. Everybody has been so kind. I have really, I don't think I've ever been treated so generously at an academic conference, so the pressure is on. <laughs> <clears throat> to not give a crappy talk, okay. <clears throat> so, let's get started. I'm gonna start by talking about cryopreservation, but it will make sense where I'm going soon enough. So cryopreservation, or deep freeze of tissues, enables storage and maintenance of biospecimens from whole human bodies, 
from plant materials and from blood samples. It allows the suspended animation and temporal transport of cells and within them DNA into the realms beyond the bodies whose lives those biologicals helped constitute. That we can barely read that code matters less than Western desires to accumulate fragments of a world that is seen as suffering under the corrosive forces of modernity, and thus certain life forms are about to be rendered extinct. So drawing blood, for example, is sometimes seen as urgent, and it, not to derive data immediately, but to preserve it in the face of the expected extinction of peoples, so it can be used in the future when new research questions are articulated or when new advanced technologies of analysis emerge. Cryopreservation's co-constitutive narrative with indigenous genetics is that gathering indigenous biomaterials is about staving off certain death. The narrative calls for preserving remnants of human groups and their non-human relations defined in molecular terms and archiving those molecular patterns before peoples or species vanish in death by admixture or through actual extinction. Paradoxically, re research ethics are changing of late. Geneticists increasingly do collaborative research with indigenous peoples, even accounting in Canada, for example, for indigenous jurisdiction. We do that a bit in the US too. Their collaborations involve figuring out how to ethically reuse old tissues for new purposes, uh, and they also include techniques of reconsent on old and archived samples. So I'm encouraged by these new ethical interventions, but Structural inequities between indigenous peoples and those who would study and manage their bodies, their lives and their biologicals remain entangled with problematic dominant narratives that continue to condition even this newer collaborative research. The vanishing of traditional or indigenous peoples in the face of globalization remains a common narrative in genetic science. So fundamental to my inquiry is to examine the role of death in deanimating indigenous living peoples the concept of death, ironically, is integral to the constitution of life as molecular by both scientists and in our popular discourse. The molecular definition of life is built upon indigenous bodies that, because they are expected to vanish, are little considered as among the living beneficiaries and the promises of genomic futures. So today I'm going to offer two critiques <clears throat> that highlight how long-standing assumptions and structural inequities continue to shape the sampling and study of indigenous bodies and biologicals, specifically non-indigenous concepts that are uh, binary concepts of life versus death and human versus non-human. These undergird assumptions about indigenous bodies and also relations between scientists and indigenous peoples. I'll then link the biopolitics of cryopreservation with other academic conversations, so animal studies and the new materialisms, that to different degrees labor under but seek to repair the same life versus death and animate versus uh, deanimate dichotomies that plague research on indigenous peoples. As these academic conversations seek new language to articulate relations between humans and non-humans, they will benefit from indigenous standpoints that never forgot the relatedness of all things. So then I will close uh, with an example of uh, relations between certain indigenous people and a vibrant stone, which is pipestone that challenges Western hierarchies of life. So this talk in a related chapter constitute an intervention in Western academic thought, a not undesirable byproduct of my broader body of work. But my ultimate goal in the work that I do <clears throat> is to support the flourishing of indigenous thought and life in the 21st century. The academy um, in that interest is integral to the colonial state that manages our lives and non-human relations too, often to our collective detriment. And so I see my position within the academy as also being in support of indigenous flourishing. I don't see the divide between these two things necessarily. <clears throat> Okay. So my first critique is that cryopreservation is implicated in the colonial appropriation of indigenous natural resources. The international biological program that ran from the early 1960s through 1974 set the stage for the biological sampling of indigenous peoples and non-humans as remnants of a bygone world threatened by an increasingly civilizing yet toxic world. IBP laid out a goal to research, quote, primitive isolates to salvage information 
that might benefit civilized communities' understandings of themselves, unquote. But that conception of indigenous bodies as natural resources, of course, the, the raw materials upon which nations are built did not begin in the 20th century. The US nation building project is founded in the appropriation of indigenous people's lands. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the US positioned itself, positioned Americans or whites as the rational agents capable of transforming nature into productive property and indigenous peoples as incapable of developing, indeed even surviving in the face of the modern industrial state. Colonial spokespersons, both government agents and anthropological and biological scientists continue today to rehearse that death song. In the 21st century, the goal is to transform natural resources now that are genomes into something of value for all humanity. Genome knowledge for the good of all, that is the mantra. But who in pragmatic terms counts as human? Who gets to figure as a potential recipient of those future benefits? Certainly, a vanishing indigene cannot make such a claim and is not included among the modern humanity that is the we addressed by genomic storytellers. Uh, as Jenny Reardon and I have written elsewhere, 21st century human genome research promotes itself as anti-racist because it undermines biological conceptions of race. Yet, paradoxically, it relies on making moral and racially hierarchical claims to the natural resources of indigenous peoples. So you can witness as the always emblematic language and imagery of uh, National Geographic's um, population geneticist Spencer Wells. Now, I pick on Spencer a lot, but it's not that academic scientists don't say similar things. It's just that he's very much in the public eye, and he has a very eloquent way with words. He's very charismatic. So when there's a film, The Journey of Man, that uh, PBS aired in 2003. You can get this on video, in which uh, Spencer Wells <clears throat> is addressing Australian Aboriginal painter Greg Singh. You can read along. So he says, what I'd like you to think about with the DNA stories we're telling is that they are that. They are DNA stories. It's our version as Europeans of how the world was populated. By the way, he's American. And where we all trace back to, that's our song line. We use science to tell us about that because we don't have the sense of direct continuity. Our ancestors didn't pass down the stories. We've lost them and we have to go out and find them. We use science, which is a European way of looking at the world to do that. You guys don't need that. So in the film, Wells responds to Singh's dubiousness that his Aboriginal ancestors trace back to Africa. Singh insists on the veracity of Aboriginal origins on the continent of Australia. He says, we know our stories, we know about creation, we know we come from here. Conversely, U.S. American Wells explains that he and his European people are still searching for their origins. You have your stories, he says to sing, we just want ours. It's an interesting reversal of the usual narrative. Europeans are presented as disadvantaged in relation to indigenous people. It's indigenous people who potentially take away if they deny their DNA, a resource without which Wells and his people will lose their past. This narrative has an interesting twist, but the old familiar pattern remains intact in which a European makes a moral claim on indigenous natural resources, this time DNA. <clears throat> so we're already into my second critique, which is that cryopreservation aims to preserve indigenous DNA, but it's predicated on indigenous death. Human genome diversity research deploys the concept of indigenous peoples always impending death in order to support a genomic rearticulation of indigenous life as rightfully the patrimony of global society. In order to support, <clears throat> in, excuse me, so it, indigenous vanishing and dying fosters genomic versions of life. And because indigenous peoples are not expected to survive, this is the logic of elimination articulated by Patrick Wolf in his analysis of settler colonialism and indigenous land appropriation. Because we are not expected to survive, indigenous people therefore do not have to be factored into the promises of genomic futures. So while cryopreservation of indigenous biologicals is about the extension, study, and preservation of life, it's a notion of molecular life focused on largely indecipherable patterns and instructions that comprise DNA scaffolding. Now, this is a materialist conception of life that I do not disagree with. <clears throat> 
It even has a bibliographic beauty as we are able to view through high-tech visualizing technologies these great dynamic and productive molecular archives. But cryopreservation also amplifies the poverty of a genomic articulation of indigeneity that becomes ever more salient in our world of genomics as nation building. Cryopreservation, like genomic indigeneity, emerges not only out of techno-scientific innovations, but also from a discourse of endangerment and death, a long-standing narrative of indigenous extinction that has pervaded Western culture for several centuries. <clears throat> so Foucault's biopower, you, which I know you haven't heard enough about, illuminates how cryopreservation makes indigenous DNA live while simultaneously narrating an indigenous death. So biopower emerged at the end of the 18th century, took hold by the 19th, replacing the ancient right of the sovereign to take life and let or let live with the power to foster life or disallow it to the point of death. So biopower focuses on morbidity not the old spectacle of death under the sovereign, but rather illnesses and permanent factors that perpetually weaken life. So biopower then produces statistics. So statistics about fertility, disease, morbidity rates, race and ethnicity, about the populations it seeks to regulate in order to bring those populations under control. Population is also a key concept that conditions genomic sampling and the rearticulation of indigenous peoples according to genome knowledge. Indigenous peoples are, for all practical purposes, conflated with the concept of a biological population in the course of research on their genomes. Given beliefs in the inevitable, impending death of indigenous people in the face of Western civilization, at the same time, that indigenous existence is crucial for both US American nationalist coherence and for the emergence of a multicultural global genomic subject, indigenous DNA as a proxy for bodies and life helps bring death within the realm of power. Indigenous death is far enough along to justify appropriating indigenous resources, but it's ultimately pushed back to the brink of extinction when indigenous genome knowledge is produced for consumption by a 21st century knowledge society. The promise of human genome diversity is, in a very real sense, the promise of eternal life. Indigenous DNA is used to signify the life and essence of long dead ancestors of founding populations. This then helps connect living people, the consumers of genome knowledge, such as the uh, customers of the Genographic Project, to those founding populations signified in indigenous bodies. This then intensifies the vitality of those genome consumers. In short, the death of indigenous peoples is simultaneously always occurring, but ultimately avoided as genome knowledge seekers tap into indigenous lives signified in immortalized DNA. Thus, the conscience of both a global society built in no small part on the extraction of indigenous resources can be soothed. So cryopreservation and its disappearing indigenous narrative aids a broader genomic death song sung ironically while indigenous peoples are more actively circulating in genome worlds. With new ways of caretaking biological samples, for example, the DNA on loan program that's operative in Canada, where property interests stay with donors in rigorous efforts to reconsent samples that I mentioned, and in indigenous managed biobanks, we see a partial disruption of hierarchies between scientists and their indigenous subjects. And we see a complication of the indigenous death narrative. So for example, biological substances derived from indigenous bodies are generative of social relations between scientists and indigenous peoples, both of whom have interest in the, these biologicals and desire to control them. Now, these kinds of social relations between scientists and their subjects help animate indigenous people, making them more agential, as genome scientists and regulators are newly paying attention to building networks with indigenous subjects, and sometimes even training them to do the science. But this is paradoxical because biovalue, the production of scientific value from human body parts is a surplus value actually produced when marginal forms of vitality, including the bodies and the body parts of the socially marginalized, are transformed into technologies to aid in the intensification of the vitality of other living beings. Again, those modern humans who seek to benefit from genome knowledge. <clears throat> 
Therefore, indigenous bodies are both deanimated in the hierarchies of civilizing scientific knowledge production while simultaneously being reanimated when in living indigenous peoples are encouraged to become scientists either in reality or when they are named as co-authors on collaborative research projects. <clears throat> So I want to just want to say just a couple of things about um, a definition of indigenous that helps me get at how they are resist how indigenous people are resisting this death narrative that's so common in this field. <clears throat> so genomic indigeneity, it's one way of defining it. And I've written a paper about this. Um, genomic indigeneity or, or genomic definitions of indigeneity ground cryopreservation practices, and these focus on this definition, the genomic definition, focuses on geographic and cultural isolation and longevity in place when it's defining that category of indigenous. Now, this overlaps partially with indigenous people's own articulations of their peoplehood. Although indigenous peoples' co-constitutions with place are not fully accounted for in genome science accounts, indigenous peoples also focus on long-standing relations to place. But I argue that indigenous peoples actually produce accounts that in their complexity emphasize the relatedness of peoples and non-humans in particular places. We might say in uh, science and technology studies parlance that indigenous peoples consider identity to be the product of a co-constitution of human and non-human communities, while human genome diversity focuses predominantly on the movements of human populations through landscapes to populate the world. To be sure, the impact of environmental factors on the selection and mutation of genetic markers figure in genomics, but human agency upon the land and linear migratory narratives through time and space are still foreground over deep human, non-human relations in place as genomic markers are made to stand for populations and as these markers and populations are narrated as moving along ancient continental migratory routes. Subsequently, contemporary populations are conceived of as the descendants of founder populations. The primary agents in such narratives are human bodies and populations moving over time and space and biologically reproducing themselves along that path. This, the simplistic dismissal then, by non-indigenous thinkers of indigenous origin stories in place, I propose, is not simply the result of privileging scientific evidence over indigenous creationism and rejecting religious, quote unquote, accounts broadly, but such dismissals seem to miss indigenous people's emphasis on land-human co-constitutive relations. For example, when indigenous peoples push back against scientific narratives of indigenous Americans' genetic origins uh, being in Africa or Siberia or whichever other debatably critical moment or place a scientific narrator wants to emphasize because they happen to find data to analyze in that place, indigenous peoples are not simply being anti-science. They may in fact be very interested in the science, but they also emphasize their emergence as particular cultural and language groups in social and cu cultural relations with non-humans of all kinds, land formations, non-human animals, plants, and other elements in very particular places, which are their homelands or traditional territories. Furthermore, genomic indigeneity also fundamentally contradicts a definition of indigenous in its explicitly political formation. Indigenous peoples and their networking demonstrate indigeneity as an organizing category added to but fundamentally constitutive of our people's specific understandings of ourselves. The concept of indigenous formed by delegates from communities around the world and transnational institutions like the United Nations helps us articulate our resistance as peoples to the assimilative tendencies of the nation state. The term is about indigenous people's survival, a we are here and we are proliferating discourse. Elizabeth Cook Lynn, who's a Native American studies scholar in the US, uh, has noted that indigeneity may be thought of as the strongest focus for resistance to imperial control in colonial societies. She also notes that contrary to the death song that's narrated by genomic scientists, indigenous peoples as a class are expanding rather than vanishing or diminishing. Now I want to bracket something before I go on to the next slide. I'm actually worried, despite the usefulness and my buy-in to indigeneity as a category that enables networking, that enables, enables pushing back against the assimilative state, I worry that it may be becoming too generative. 
It sparks networks, it sparks these shared decolonization lessons, but it's also, in my experience working in the US and Canada, proliferating individual ancestral reclaimings that seem to be overshadowing the intended people-tied nature of this umbrella term and the collective struggles of peoples in place. So I worry that it's generating these kind of individual claims and we're losing what, what the category was meant to do, which is help people, land-based peoples come together to articulate uh, opposition to colonial states. And we, that may come up in the Q&A. Okay, so let's talk about indigenizing interspecies thinking. So I'm gonna link cryopolitics with other conversa conversations that can similarly be informed by indigenous standpoints. We've seen an upsurge in animal studies scholarship, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, in which humanities and social science scholars are attempting to reclaim some of the knowledge territory claimed for several centuries by the natural sciences, and then to lessen hierarchies between Westerners and their non-human others. A good example is multi-species ethnography in which scholars apply anthropological approaches to studying social relations between humans and non-humans. So there was a 2010 uh, issue of cultural anthropology in which Kirksey and Helmreich wrote about new anthropological accounts, multi-species ethnographies of organisms. So they looked at um, non-human animals, plants, microbes, fungi, these non-humans previously relegated to the status of bare life or that which is killable are now considered alongside humans as shaping and shaped by political, economic, and cultural forces. These ideas articulate with uh, Dorian Sagan's thinking on interspecies communities and his critique of two linear evolutionary narratives. Sagan is a science writer, if you're not familiar with him, he's the son of astronomer Carl Sagan and the biologist Lynn Margulis. Sagan dismantles hierarchies in the relationships of some, some humans to some non-humans. He writes of symbiogenesis and the importance of microbes in constituting humans, so he explains we are crisscrossed and cohabited by stranger beings, intimate visitors who affect our behavior, appreciate our warmth, and are in no rush to leave. Like all visible life forms, we humans are composites. So to my ear, this account of symbiogenesis leans towards an ethos of we are all related. I read in Sagan that we are all of us human and non-human networked sets of social biological relations. He calls these human non-human networks interspecies communities which resonates with what Vine Deloria Jr. called an American Indian metaphysic, a set of first principles we must possess in order to make sense of the world that we live in. It is, according to Deloria, the realization that the world and all its possible experiences constituted a social reality, a fabric of life in which everything had the possibility of intimate knowing relationships because ultimately everything was related. But Deloria and Sagan's understandings of intimate human-non-human relations are not in complete harmony, of course. In the opening of a 2010 anthropological, um, American Anthropological Association keynote, Dorian Sagan turned his attention to life, and I quote, he said, well, it is to this universe that I want to turn again and to a specific part of it. I want to turn to life. And within that, part of a fascinating subsystem, the one in which, of course, we are most interested, that is humanity ourselves. So for Sagan, life is limited to things that are organismically defined. This tends to be true not only of biophysical scientists, but also of social scientists and humanists who engage in animal studies. Multi and interspecies conversations restrict attentions to beings that live, according to a definition that cannot completely contain indigenous standpoints. In an American Indian metaphysic, as Deloria des describes it, the notion of interspecies must be stretched to include non-human others that are not understood as living within even critical Western frameworks. So this is an example um, in the work of my colleague, Craig Howe. He's an Oglala Lakota architect. Um, he's also trained as an anthropologist and he's a Lakota studies expert. So he left the academy to found the Center for American Indian Research and Native Studies, which he built on his family's land between the Pine Ridge and Rosebud Indian Reservations in South Dakota. So at that facility, Craig runs Lakota studies workshops. Um, he also lives in contact with a host of, uh, daily contact with a host of non-humans on his land. And he documents those relations weekly in his blog, which is called Oko Iyawapi, or Week Count. 
Um, and so that's a digital weekly version or spin-off of the traditional Lakota winter count, which you may have seen uh, old pictures of. So um, Hal blogs his engagements, for example, with rabbits who observe him when he works outside, who take afternoon naps in the shade of his structures, or thwart his architectural projects with their own work. They're always digging. Um, <clears throat> And then he, st he also studies the lodges of spiders, which are akin to teepees in their form. He follows the movements of star people in relation to distant buttes as he plots and builds the structures uh, at the Cairns facility. So how documents his relations with non-humans, including those that are normally excluded in animal studies. And this is just a brief example of the kind of daily work that he does that I think can be encompassed more by what Vine Deloria Jr. was getting at. I encourage you to go to his blog. It's really beautiful. You just see it's so, go it's so gorgeous out there. All right, this might be more familiar territory. So what's not new about the new materialisms? <clears throat> so I want to turn to this conversation uh, because non-indigenous thinkers are addressing this divide between life, not life, that I think is really important to address. And they're attempting to expand conceptions of humans' intimate relations. And this is encouraging for me as an indigenous person because I see us at a moment in the academy when difficult as translation is between very different languages and orientations, I feel like there's a moment in which we actually have, inter we have the capacity to have a conversation because I feel like the academy is actually at a moment now where we can. And so work in the new materialism seeks to extend our understanding of how non-human lives press into and are co-constituted with human lives and therefore how non-humans are agentic in our world. It stands in the space where animal studies and the interspecies thinking, I think, falls short. But these things are kind of all mushing into one another, right? Um, so here's a quote from uh, the, uh, which book is this? Oh, it's the New Materialisms volume by Cooley and Frost. Um, finally, uh, we are summoning a new materialism in response to a sense that the radicalism of the dominant discourses which have flourished under the cultural turn is now more or less exhausted. The dominant constructivist orientation to social analysis is inadequate for thinking about matter, materiality, and politics in ways that do justice to the contemporary context of biopolitics and global political economy. Similarly, Jane Bennett asks us to take seriously the vitality of things, meaning the capacity of things, edibles, commodities, storms, metals, not only to impede or block the will and designs of humans, but also to act as quasi-agents or forces with trajectories, propensities, or tendencies of their own. She refers to this sometimes as an enchanted materialism. So why should we care about this? These scholars explain that taking seriously the vitality of non-human, non-living things might shift our public responses to political problems. They and other humanists and social scientists are reappraising the importance of materiality to human, social, and cultural life. So the world is medi mediated heavily through culture, but the material is also productive. It's not simply static, dead and acted upon. The new materialists hold that to really grasp the nature of and potential solutions for the world's critical problems, be that environmental degradation, uh, climate change, poverty, continuous war, non-humans and all of their multiple forms have to be given their due. Mel Chen writes in Animacies um, about a similar intellectual political project. After an extended illness, Chen was forced to rethink the life and death boundary, that fragile division between animate and inanimate. So Chen disrupts additional binaries, human, animal, dynamism, stasis, subject, object, that also underlie violent hierarchies in our world. In place of life or liveliness, Chen invokes the language of animacy defined in relation to agency, awareness, mobility, and liveness. So for Chen, animacy is much more than the state of being animate. Chen writes of the animacy of mercury, for example, or lead, that poison human and non-human bodies. And I'm interested in Chen because more than the new materialist, Chen is thinking about the role of indigenous thought in understanding and disrupting what, what uh, Chen calls animacy hierarchies. And this is unsurprising because Chen's broader project is to explore the roles of race and sexuality in shaping animacy in relation to humans, animals, living, and dead things. But this is where we differ. Chen seeks a secular language, and that's Chen's word, to express the animacy of non-humans. And so does Bennett, who explains that material vibrancy is not a spiritual supplement or life force added to the matter said to house it. <clears throat> 
On the other hand, as an indigenous person, I'm pretty comfortable in folding so-called spirits or souls into descriptions of the beingness of non-humans. Charles Eastman, who was born on the cusp of that transition from a nomadic plains life to a forced reservation life in the mid-1800s, wrote in his 1911 book, The Soul of the Indian, that the elements and majestic forces in nature, lightning, wind, water, fire, and frost, were regarded with awe as spiritual powers but perhaps always secondary and intermediate in character. We believe that the spirit pervades all creation and that every creature possesses a soul in some degree, though not necessarily a soul conscious of itself. The tree, the waterfall, the grizzly bear, each is an embodied force and as such an object of reverence. So in this passage, he's explaining an American Indian spiritual, and I use that word in quotes, approach to a US American Christian audience in 1911. So clearly Christian thought had become, um, had in part helped re-articulate American Indian thought at that moment, yet still he wrote in the early 20th century of American Indian life and history from a native standpoint. Both Eastman and Deloria can be understood within a framework that sees social relations not only between animals, human and non-human, but also with energy, spirits, rocks, stars, in the constitution of American Indian knowledge about the world. Deloria called this an American Indian metaphysic. I'll call it an indigenous metaphysic, although I'm still thinking about that. But meaning that it's an understanding of the intimate, knowing relatedness of all things. This includes what I describe as the co-constitutive entanglements between the material and the immaterial. That is, indigenous people's social relations also with spirit beings, for lack of a better term. This is a boundary crossing that would be difficult for interspecies thinkers and, and new materialist thinkers. For non-indigenous society, much work has been done to erect a barrier between what it is thought humans can know through their materialistic empirical investigations and what some humans believe to exist beyond the knowable material world. This knowing belief divide, as uh, Paul Nadezhdi's an anthropologist points out, is a form of discrediting language used, for example, by even sympathetic anthropologists when explaining indigenous people's ontologies, this, this knowing belief divide. So I just want to also say that Eastman and Deloria get classed as American Indian intellectuals, which was the pertinent racial category of the 20th century, but they were both in fact Dakota, so they're from my same cultural and language group. <clears throat> we Dakota are part of a broader cultural group, the Osheti Shakaween, that also includes Lakota and Nakota peoples. We've been mislabeled as Sioux, that's how most of you would have known us. Um, so it's not simply that I'm ethnocentric, which I am, <laughs> um, that I'm drawing on Dakota thinkers, but it's that their work constitutes a large body of work in English that is helpful for thinking about these things. But I think it would be really exciting to see other scholars of indigenous thought, um, people who are working with the intellectual production of other indigenous peoples to add to this conversation. So on that note, I want to call attention to the work of yet another scholar of UMA indigenous thought, and that is David Delgado Shorter at the uh, University of California, Los Angeles. Shorter provides us a language beyond the spiritual for capturing the kinds of multi-being forms of relating that indigenous peoples have engaged in. And you can see uh, what he's saying here. This is from an article called, um, I think it's just called Spirituality. So he says, uh, spiritual, um, rather than being spiritual, native people were relating. Less cumbersome than intersubjective, related might best replace spiritual, since it neither denies possible theisms or hierarchies. One's relations are not solely related by blood or tribal heritage. They are the families chosen and not chosen. They are the humans and other than humans sharing and withholding power. They provide meaning and identity beyond the confines of race, tribe, and species. In these ways, being related offers more than any abstract notion of religion or spirituality ever could. Indigenous thinkers have contributions to make, is my point, to conversations in which human societies rethink the range of non-human beings with whom we see ourselves in intimate relation. And precisely because of the varied ways in which indigenous peoples relate, possibilities for being in the world. The advantage of indigenous analytical frameworks that are not secular and actually Protestant secular, because that's the kind of secularism we have going in the, in the academy, is that they are more likely to have kept sight of the profound influence in the world of beings categorized by Western thinkers, both the church and science. 
in hierarchical ways as animal or less animate. Now that theorists seek frameworks for dismantling those hierarchies, we should remember that not everyone needs to summon a new analytical framework or needs to renew a commitment to the vitality of so-called things. Indigenous standpoints that didn't construct hierarchies in the same way, I think should be at the front edge of this new work, conversing with it and bringing additional insights. Now, bringing indigenous thought into these conversations is not only about increasing rigor and multiculturalism in the academy, and I also want to say that when I talk about indigenous thought, I don't argue for a static notion of indigenous traditional knowledge, but rather I'm talking about engaging the syncretic thinking that living indigenous peoples do today, people like Craig Howe. Uh, infiltrating the academy, I think, is but a step towards a more important goal, which is to construct disciplines that better serve the interests of indigenous peoples and other marginalized peoples. Um, the, the disciplines, this is because the disciplines are looked to by a knowledge society to make policy decisions and to address pressing societal problems. And if we're going to be the subjects of those policies, which we have been, um, particularly in federal Indian policy in this country, we need to have our standpoints engaged in the knowledge production within the, the academy. So indeed, considerable damage has been done to both indigenous people and their non-human relations when those peoples were displaced from traditional lands that were then often subjected to environmental degradation. So when indigenous people have had their communal land holding disrupted and they've been subjected to uh, governmental assimilation policies that include forced conversions to Christianity and the imposition of that state religion spirit material divide. These dichotomies continually undermine indigenous relatings with non-humans. The Idle No More movement that began in Canada uh, takes this up. It foregrounds links between violations by the colonial state of indigenous rights and violations of the earth by extractive industries. Articulating indigenous thought with academic and policy frameworks matters for us as indigenous people not only the academy, because we cannot let those old science, religion, human, animal, life, not life divides continue to pervert understanding of our life ways by institutions that are used to govern our lives, the land and the lives of non-humans who have all been savaged together by these Western analytical frameworks and institutions. And I really like the way that Idle No More is, is always uh, paying attention to um, articulating the fate of both humans and non-humans. They also are really good about articulating the, uh, about attaching the fate of, of indigenous Canadians to non-indigenous Canadians. And so they want indigenous people to be at the center of this movement, but, but it's not simply about indigenous people. So now we're gonna talk about Pipestone. How am I doing on time? Because I'm not good at keeping it myself. Oh, yeah. So this is my new ethnographic project. So I want to turn to life and blood in the form of a stone. So I'm going to turn from non-human organisms, from multi-species relations, and from indigenous DNA to pipestone. So I spent the last dozen years studying the life and death, both material and symbolic, that inhere in the production of Native American DNA from blood samples frozen out of place and time. Both blood and the DNA within it are material semiotics, so they're constituted of molecules and signs, metaphors and long-standing narratives, as I've shown, of indigenous peoples vanishing. And these, uh, both the materiality and these, these narratives are what make indigenous DNA um, things of value. So starting with DNA and cryopreservation helps me tell the intellectual history of how I got to here, to where I'm now investigating the life that inheres in a particular stone and the social relations that proliferates as that stone emerges from earth, as it's carved into pipe, and then as that pipe is passed from hand to hand. You've heard these called peace pipes? Oh, I've got a visual on the next slide. But that's, that's wrong. We don't call them that. We just call them pipes. Um, Pipestone, the stone that I'm looking at, is otherwise known as Catlinite, after the 19th century US American artist who painted that site, which is now known as the Pipestone Quarries in southwest Minnesota. And that's where the redstone is cut from the earth. Now there's a, a creation story, and I've got an excerpt up here, that tells about the blood in that stone. It's a story that along with present day loving attention to the stone's materiality, 
helps us understand its vibrancy for those who work with it and for many Native American tribes across the country that are invested in these quarries. So when I talk about vibrancy, of course, I'm not talking about cellular vibrancy, which I've been more accustomed to talking about. Um, but we can describe Pipestone as vibrant because without it, uh, the prayers um, of those who, who carry the pipe would be grounded, human social relations would be impaired, and the everyday lives of couriers and carvers who work with the stone daily would be deprived of the meaning that they derive from working with that rock. So the story um, is a flood story, and there, there's a film of it actually that's shown at the, the park site, but it's a traditional story in which a young woman is the, is the only one to survive um, atop a hill. It's a flood story, so every culture has flood stories, right? So she's the only one to survive from her community and she runs to the top of this hill and then the blood of all her dead people once the waters recede are pooled in this place and this later becomes the pipestone quarries so the stone is sometimes spoken of as a relative and this in part harkens back to that story but I think it also um, betrays a sense of relatedness with that stone in that place so it was fascinating to me once I got into this ethnographic project how much the narrative did not change from Native American DNA to the Pipestone quarries. I would not have expected that even though I was born in Pipestone and I grew up at, on a reservation 20 miles from there and I went there almost weekly as a child. Um, but like 20th and 21st century bioscientists when they're, with their imperative to bleed indigenous peoples before we vanish, a 19th century Euro-American painter, Catlin, Catlin and early 20th century geologists and federal agents saw the place where the redstone lies as an artifact of a waning time and culture, so they produced a national monument to conserve it. The binaries at play then and today are past, present, tradition, modernity, alive versus dead or dying. The US Park Service pamphlets from the Pipestone Minnesota Quarry represent pipes as artifacts, as craft objects, and they detail the geology and the history of white incursion into the quarry in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They also talk about the regulatory response of the US federal government. Now these material and regulatory histories are not unimportant, but like the production of indigenous biological samples abstracted from living bodies and vibrant peoples, Western politics and knowledge surrounding the quarry in effect maintain a knowledge binary between the material and the immaterial. Yet in liberal multiculturalist tradition, the Park Service also acknowledges indigenous spiritual beliefs and practices related to Pipestone. Now, indigenous people at the quarries resist binary narratives in part. While Dakota couriers and carvers reject narratives of dead and vanished Indians, past versus present, the sacred and related to this, the traditional are key concepts for some of those couriers and for many of our people. Now, the stone is also sometimes, as I said, spoken of as a relative, and the quarries are at the center of courier lives. Regardless of whether the quarries are referred to as sacred or not, not all of the couriers are comfortable using the, the, the concept of the sacred, all, although I would say most are. So the point is, is that this idea of the sacred I view as sort of this um, big fish in the rushing water surrounding the Pipestone Quarry discourse. So it's not only science that relies upon a material immaterial binary, but it is the discourse of the sacred as taken up by indigenous peoples ourselves. I think that helps further such thinking. The Park Service and some concerned Native American tribes are currently struggling ethically with the commercial sale of pipestone objects from the quarries. And on this slide, you can see some of them. Uh, they sell, in addition to pipes, they sell necklaces, smudge bowls made out of pipestone, keychains, earrings, uh, even incense burners. And then tourists come into the gift shop. It's largely tourists, and they'll buy things made of pipestone. Um, so the Park Service and the 23 affiliated tribes are debating this right now. Maybe we can get to more of this in the Q&A. So my point is, though, that talking about the stone as sacred, we can only think about it as sacred if we simultaneously embrace the idea of the profane. So this stance, and this is one of the things I'm, I'm going to try to work out in this ethnography, is potentially at odds with a view of relationality that exists in our tribal languages and which points to indigenous peoples and the stone existing in these more complex and intimate relations. 
including historically the trade of stone, because we know historically our ancestors did trade, now we're in a cash economy, but, but some of the couriers argue that that's a contemporary form of trade. This relatively modern notion of the sacred, as we use it in English, doesn't, is not really able to accommodate this practice, and we're having some serious debates about this right now at Pipestone. Okay. So this is the fun part. Has anybody seen this film, the others? Somebody's seen it, right? Isn't it a great film? Maybe I'm just, I love this film. It's not very Christian. I think that's why it doesn't, I think, it doesn't have a very Christian view of the spirit world. So <clears throat> this provokes some thinking for me. So Jane Bennett closes Vibrant Matter with this eloquent manifesto. I just love this. I feel like a preacher when I say this. I believe in one matter energy, the maker of things, Seen and unseen, I believe that this pluriverse is traversed by heterogeneities that are continually doing things. I believe it is wrong to deny vitality to non-human bodies, forces, and forms, and that a careful course of anthropomorphization can help reveal that vitality, even though it resists full translation and exceeds my comprehensive grasp. I believe that encounters with lively matter can chasten my fantasies of human mastery, highlight the common materiality of all that is, expose a wider distribution of agency and reshape the self and its interests. So that's very eloquent. I like that. But Bennett, like the other new materialists, is pretty much silent regarding uh, indigenous presence and intellectual work around the world. And when I read this literature, which is very generative for me, I'm really struck uh, by the lack of acknowledgement that indigenous peoples might have something to add to this conversation. So when I was getting into this material, the, this, this film, The Others from 2001, starring Nicole Kidman, came to mind for me. Um, and it gives me a good analogy for understanding indigenous absence in these literatures and then also the important work of indigenous movements. So the protagonist in this film, Grace, lives alone in a mansion in the countryside um, with her two children, and her husband is away on the front. This is, uh, did I say this is England? Uh, away at war. And um, her children have this disease, uh, xeroderma pigmentosa, I think it's called, and in which sunlight is poisonous to them. So they, they play at night. The windows are all uh, shaded, big heavy curtains, and they, they eat at night, they play at night, they, they, they get their schooling at night, and then during the day they sleep in these heavily curtained rooms. Well. Grace starts to hear things go bump in the house, but she can't see anything, and her little girl um, says that she sees spirits, but Grace can't see them. And so then one night, this old woman and an old man and a young woman come to the door, and they tell her that they used to be servants in the house, and um, there had been an ad or something in the paper, and they want to come back and, and help her with the children and keep the house up. So it eventually becomes clear that Grace and her children and the servants are in fact the spirits. But Grace can't remember. She had this fit of uh, despair and loneliness and kind of went mad and what happened was she smothered her children and then she shot herself. And she remembers this when confronted with some evidence. She finds pictures of the, the um, the servant's dead, and then she goes out to the graveyard near the house and sees their names, and then all of this comes flooding back to her. And so anyway, it's the living that Grace can't see, and the, the servants tell her, the old woman tells her, you know, you have to learn to live with the living. You have to accommodate them. They're not going anywhere, and we can't leave this house. So it, it struck me when I, when I remembered this film that Grace is terrified with the, the claims that the living make on her house. She's terrified by their presence, but she has to learn to live with them and accommodate them. And furthermore, she has to remember her unspeakable acts. And this is going to help her learn to live with the living. And so it struck me that that's kind of what's going on with the sort of dominant popular imagination and indigenous peoples in the US, that it's our voices and our presence um, we seem like the others that Western thought cannot comprehend as living. I mean, we're there, we're making noise, we're pushing on things, and we're, we're crying out, but people can't see us, and we're continuously erased and continuously not seen, even when our bodies are there in front of people. People are terrified of the types of claims that we might make. This country is a crime. It is a crime. And there, there are claims that get made because of that, and you can't undo that. It's easier to not see. So. This is, in this theoretical turn, um, to attend, this, 
to attend to pressing social problems as Idle More, No More demonstrates, this film helped me see that it's actually that the, the nation, the settler colonial nation needs to learn to see indigenous peoples in all of our vitalness, not as these deanimated, less evolved beings, and that seeing us as fully alive is key to also seeing decimated lands, waters, and other non-humans as fully alive. Our fates are tied in the Americas, and I'll only speak about the Americas, perhaps we can speak about other places, but that's what I know, and it's what I think about. So understanding genocide and its full meaning in the Americas, for example, requires an understanding of the entangled genocide of humans and non-humans here. Indigenous peoples are cohered as peoples in relation to very specific places and non-human communities, so their, out, their and our decimation goes hand in hand. Defining and understanding the problem adequately is precisely a situation that requires bridging materiality and uh, sociality. So the new materialisms may be taken in our academic community as some kind of new turn, but its fundamental insights are not, of course, new to everyone. They are ideas that not so roughly translated undergird what we can call an indigenous metaphysic, that matter is lively, we Dakota might say alive, that there is a common materiality of all that is, we Dakota might say we are all related, that agency should be understood as distributed more widely among human and non-human beings, and understanding these things can help change change how we humans see our place in the world and therefore how we act. Seeing and understanding matter differently will help us to interrogate the non-sensibilities of the animacy hierarchy that Mel Chen describes, including how such hierarchy shapes the actions of scientists and institutions involved in cryopolitical and other conservationist projects. When scientists and states conceive of indigenous peoples and lively others as deanimated, the vanishing indigeny trope is a constant reaffirmation of this. They assign narrow value into indigenous bodies, histories, and identities, and this enables those tiresome scientific arguments for the preservation of indigenous biologicals and natural resources for non-indigenous knowledge production. Deanimating indigenous peoples enables our domestication and our control, and unfortunately for everyone, it hinders paths that might be informed by dynamic indigenous conceptual frameworks that could help lessen global devastation. So I want to close. Do I? Oh, I don't have it up here. Okay. But I want to close with a quote by a colleague of mine, uh, Linda Knoll. She's uh, from Mendocino and Lake Counties, California, and she's a Koyunkawi poet. She's also an acorn mush maker. Now, acorn mush, for those of you that don't know, was both a starvation food and it was medicine uh, for native peoples in that area. And Linda explained to me a few years ago the way in which um, humans, woodpecker, deer, as well as the oak trees themselves must all share the acorns in the life of that tree. And she said to me, I don't mind being close to nature, but I know what they mean when they say that and that's not what I mean. So in that simple statement, Linda Knoll is not privileging any human uh, or a human condition, but rather the interdependence of all of these relations. And I've really taken that, that lesson to heart. So I'm not ashamed to, sh ashamed to say I'm part of nature, but it may not mean what you thought it mean, meant, right? <laughs> all right, thank you. So we have some time for uh, Dr. Talbert to take questions. So kind of similar to last night, right? Um, if you have questions for her, please come line up. Um, and we'll sit in these middle seats this time. I always like Q&A better. <laughs> I'll get us started. Um, thank you so much You're for welcome. your talk. This was, uh, there's I'm so looking much. for my pen, but go ahead. Would you like a pen? No, it's okay. <laughs> I'll remember. Good. Um, so let's see if I can get my words straight. You know, one of the things I, I hear you talking about is this idea that indigenous thought and indigenous scholars are so often left out of these conversations around vibrancy or new materialisms. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when 
folks, I think, especially working, say, in the environmental movement, tend to invoke uh, indigenous knowledge or indigenous traditions. Um, sometimes, like within the animism scholarship, it's referred to as the, an alterity to a faulty modernity. Um, there's uh, an anxiety and I think oftentimes a, a reflexive concern about turning to indigenous knowledge as being a further colonization mm. or a further appropriation of, of knowledge. Um, and sometimes in my own conversations with other scholars, uh, that leads to a hesitancy yeah. to engage that knowledge. And um, so without making you a spokesperson for engaging indigenous knowledge, I wonder if you have any thoughts about those of us coming from Western traditions, working from within those traditions about engaging indigenous knowledges, bringing them into conversation uh, without committing that sort of further appropriation or colonization. Right, I, you know, I went to the feminist um, methodologies roundtable this afternoon and that was really making me think about that too. Um, because I don't advocate everybody go do collaborative research with indigenous communities. And you know, not everybody wants to do that and working with indigenous communities is really hard, you know. And if you don't really want to spend a lot of your time figuring out how to do that, best not to. You know, it's better to not do it at all than do it badly. Um, for me, it would just be a big step even to acknowledge that Native people are part of the audience. You know, that's really, that, that goes a long way in acknowledging that we are not a they, but we are a you. Um, and, and, you know, even opening up a question or highlighting that, even if it's not your particular area or you haven't spent time with those communities or you're not reading indigenous scholarship or doing community-based participatory research in an, indigenous, in an indigenous community, but just that acknowledging that we're part of the audience. And then I think if you approach the world with that idea that indigenous peoples are a you and not a they, you know, especially a dead and dying they, you'll begin to see indigenous people more. You'll see opportunities for that and you will probably invite uh, people you know, in your talks or in your work to come engage with you. And, and so yeah, I don't know if that helps, but I think that goes a long way. Really, we, when Shepard Kretsch wrote The Ecological Indian, I'm one of the few native scholars I know that had a mostly favorable review of that book, but you know where he really went wrong is he <laughs> talked about in, the Indian like it was a they and they were not part of a you and people just don't acknowledge that we read books, we have cable television, we, get, we have YouTube videos. I mean, we're out there. Um, I don't know how people continue to think that we're a they all the time. Does that help? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, really, it, it goes a long way. <laughs> oh, I know I lost Jake's pen. <laughs> it looked like a nice one, too. Yes, hi, thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, I lived in Minnesota for about for a few years, uh -huh. and I I lived very close to where where the Ojibwe uh, were. And one thing I noticed was, you know, I like the way that that you talked about the move that movie, you know, because mm -hmm. um, people knew that they were there, but as far as the Ojibwe themselves, I knew a lot of them that were moving away mm -hmm. because they could not find within either within their lands or help from other people and they were moving from Minnesota to South Dakota or to North Dakota to find to find better work and I wondered you know what was your thought on that what's your thought on this kind of migration of you know the Ojibwe or you know tribes go leaving their ancestral land to try to find something better you know where it's kind of like squeezing them out of out of there so. Yeah, I mean, people circulate all the time, right? And this has been, you know, you could say that um, Native people, particularly in tribes where they were maybe not as agricultural or they were more migratory, uh, but there are traditions of migrating uh, through particular hunting lands, you know, tr historically. But then when you have colonization happening and you have the reservation era beginning in the late 19th, early 20th century, um, you have this whole set of political economic conditions throughout the 20th century that are forcing natives either onto the reservation or off the reservation. Um, we do have a history, both pre-contact and post-contact, of, of this migratory history. Um, 
and it's true on a lot of reservations, the economies are really bad. The, the, um, un, the employment rates are terrible on many of them, although with the casino era, that's really helped, actually, uh, offering fuller employment. I often say to people, you know, a lot of Native people I know are not freaked out as much by the current economic situation because our ancestors already suffered an apocalypse. So to us, things aren't going to get any worse than what they went through. Um, and it tends to be, you know, I don't know, other people who haven't suffered their apocalypse yet that are more worried that that's coming. Um, so, you know, I mean, I myself and my family members and many of the people I know throughout Indian country in the United States are constantly going back and forth between these places. And there's like a fluctuation, right? You leave when there's no jobs. This happened during World War II. You had mass migration off reservations. And then in the, with the Indian self-determination era in the 70s, you had people coming back. Uh, gaming came out of that, it offered full employment, people come back. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I don't see it as... Definitely, there's a restriction of opportunities on reservations. That's true. If there weren't, I would still be there. But, but, but uh, in general, people kind of circulate in and out because family draws you home and the land draws you home too. Um, but, but you also need to survive. That probably is a non-answer. That's what I think, though. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. That was a great talk. I appreciate it. A oh, lot thanks. to think about. Um, I wanted to ask you a practical okay. and easier question as a teacher. Oh. Um, so I was thinking, I, there's a Chilean philosopher slash biologist who I really love named Fra Francisco Varela, and he brings together ecology with Buddhist thinking. Hmm. It's his thing, and, mm -hmm. and, and I love it. It's made me think a lot more about ecology. But as a teacher, I'm always trying to figure out like how to bring in things that feel coded as spiritual mm -hmm. and treat it as philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I want and, and I, I struggle with this, mm -hmm. like how to talk about it in ways and how to think about it in ways. And, and, and I was wondering how you approach that. Well, I mean, for me, it's not really a it might be a problem if I were to try to draw on Buddhist thought because I'm not a Buddhist and I don't know any really that much about that. Um, but when I draw on, for example, Native people writing about ethnobotany programs and tribes, I mean, ethnobotany is a, I mean, you can critique that term, but there are, there are, there are programs and tribes that are doing that and where they are taking um, science, but they are also, I mean, like I look at our tribal ethnobotany program uh, in my tribe in Sisseton and then our tribal college students are involved in that. They're doing science and, and tribes in the U.S. are pretty good about having environmental science programs actually in regulatory uh, systems. But they also will have elders come in or even some of the people trained in the university in environmental science will also have a, and they still use the word spiritual, but I'm trying to not use that word, orientation towards these things. So for example, they might do science, but they might also say, well, our ancestors got names for plants because they got it in a dream or a vision, and you don't just go out around the landscape naming things. You know, those things will tell you or reveal to you what their names are, and they will reveal to you what their knowledge properties are. You need to listen and pay attention and not assume that you you are the only agent that can go do that. I guess you could call that spiritual, right? And I, so I look to our own tribal contemporary practices that are, that are merging Western science and that kind of thought together, and people are really struggling with how to articulate back and forth between those things and so for me it's not it's not a problem how, how to do it in the classroom I just turn to what people are doing out out there in Indian country and assign their work so maybe I have it easier <laughs> yeah Clint, Clint Carroll uh, Cherokee Nation guy has a new book out on ethnobotany on University of Minnesota Press that's a plug for his book yeah thank you for the wonderful talk um, I'm a graduate student uh, in geography at, at UW-Madison uh, and I've, I've done some work with uh, indigenous communities, particularly uh, Ojibwe, Anishinaabe communities. Um, and I am new to the whole political ecology thing. Uh, this is Me my too. first <laughs> conference, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, but what, something I picked up, I've picked up on this, this weekend being here is, is, I mean, just sort of highlighted for me more, is, is this dichotomy between the urban and the rural um, in terms of, you know, thinking about human, people environment relationships and and so I've you know I primarily have I have friends and and people that I work with in uh, on a reservation community um, but I've also met you know urban uh, people from urban Native American communities in Minneapolis and Chicago um, and I'm wondering if you think in, in your discussion of animacy if uh, and recognizing that 
indigenous culture as a, as a, as a living, changing thing, if there are differences in, in how um, you know, Native Americans sort of who were brought up on the reservation um, or have direct, you know, very strong connections to the reservation um, would view animacy in that culture, you know, if, if there is any cultural difference um, between animacy, you know, in that setting versus uh, urban indigenous communities. Well, aside from that, they wouldn't use that word, right? But the, the concept, um, yeah. you know, I, because I grew up in between South Dakota and the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, and, and, and in Minneapolis and St. Paul, it's Dakota and Anishinaabe people. It's not like other urban areas in the country where Minneapolis was not a relocation site. So federal relocation policy moved Native Americans from reservations in the 1950s, and they tried to both terminate tribes and then make make a, individual American citizens out of Native people, you know, and get them to be employed in the city and have nuclear families and all that, and because the collectivity of the, the tribe was inhibiting them becoming full citizens in the minds of assimilationist policymakers. But so while Minneapolis, it, it was not one of those cities. Chicago was, I think San Francisco, Oakland were, uh, Denver was. Um, Minneapolis has got a really interesting history, and so that's where my urban Indian experience comes out of. But it's unusual in that it's deeply tied to Dakota reservations and Anishinaabe reservations. And people are always migrating, at least in, in, in my experience, between the cities and out for Dakota people. It's to the south west into Minnesota and South Dakota and for Anishinaabe, it's up north. Um, and so it's hard to say you're an urban Indian or a reservation Indian in that city because so, but I would say I suppose if you're somebody like I met relocate grandchildren of relocation people in the Bay Area and there was a, a sort of, it seemed to me, and this is all my opinion, kind of a more mythical hearkening back to the homeland that just, it was less, um, less real for them or and and yeah I, I don't know how you maintain a, I don't know how you maintain those relations when you're when you're off in a city 1500 miles away from the, the land base of your ancestors I don't know what people in those places do I mean you kind of have to ask them this is one of the reasons I left the Bay Area actually I don't resonate with that, those forms of indigenous organizing. I come from a land-based place, and while I live in Texas, I go home. I work with northern communities a lot. I work with land-based communities. I'm interested in indigenous governance. That's a land-based form of governance. I'm not terribly, it's not my project to think about uh, individual indigenous reclaimings of ancestry or identity. That is just not my project. So I, I don't know what their levels of knowledge are, and um, I, I'm somebody who thinks you've got to be in relationship with place, and you've got to be in relationship uh, with those non-humans, or you're missing a lot of the relatives of your peoples. How are you a people that is constituted in relationship to that place when you never go there and when you're never in that collectivity? And I realize that people didn't make a choice to be denied that, but you know, there's a, a quote by a historian of science I often quote, I can't remember who said it, but it's in Ro a book of Robert Proctor's, and it, this, this uh, Peter Dwyer said, um, the idea of evolution has conditioned an odd understanding that we are what we were and not what we became. I am not only interested in who indigenous peoples were, I am interested in who we are becoming, and we have to be, keep becoming in relationship to, to, the land, to the land that helped make us. You have to find some way to do that, I think. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's kind of the orientation that I'm coming from when I talk about these things. Hi, um, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, you actually already answered two of the primary questions that I had, so thanks also to the other people who asked questions. Okay. Um, particularly the first one about the potential dangers of mm, appropriation. Um, but relatedly, I, I was wondering if you could maybe speak to the possible dangers of characterizing or romanticizing indigenous relationships to nature, quote unquote, um, in the sort of offensive terminology of the noble savage and the, this idea of uh, native peoples existing in a static state of a pristine nature in, in maybe trying to draw upon um, contemporary indigenous ideas about uh, like the American the American Indian metaphysics is that something that you're concerned about is my question am I concerned about the dangers of the noble savage and attaching native people to facile notions of nature it particularly in if yes 
yeah. clearly, it, particularly in <laughs> Western people trying to, people who are not uh, indigenous, mm -hmm. trying to draw upon ind indigenous thought uh, related to the issue of appropriation. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, there's a lot, there's a lot of, a lot to say about that, and I've seen so many great talks um, here that where people are, are problematizing this, right? So, I mean, you all probably already know a lot of this. Um, you know, the, the immediate danger of the noble savage, and I think I had that in some of these images, is again, it's portraying us as dead and dying and as a part of the past. It's also a denial of colonialism and genocide. I mean, how are, how is anybody supposed to live like that end of the trail image? Hello, colonization happened, right? Um, at the same time, when one is denying that we're alive and we're vibrant and dynamic and, and trying to adjust and adapt to this world, um, it disallows uh, these more syncretic kinds of practices, you know? So it's a real bind to be stuck in that, that noble savage category. It just, it, it binds you into where you can't really do anything. And we, of course, don't live up to that. Our environmental programs don't live up to that. Who we are as people who move for the world doesn't, doesn't jive with that. Um, what was the other part of your question? It was about... Yes. I'm sorry, uh, maybe I wasn't clear at all. It was, it was if... You're concerned, if you're explicitly concerned about people drawing on that image mm -hmm. when they're trying to draw upon ideas, uh, that indigenous people's ideas about humans' relationships with nature and yeah. in, in the new materialisms. So when scholars are attempting to draw on indigenous thought, but maybe yeah. they're going towards that kind of exactly. image? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, this is why I said I don't think it's everybody's job to engage uh, indigenous people. I mean, some people, that's just not what, 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 you, what you're doing. It's not where you're at. Um, and so again, just opening up a space for inviting indigenous people into the conversation or acknowledging that we're part of the audience. I think for those, there are people out there already working with indigenous communities who if, certainly if you go into those communities, you come out uh, realizing that that's the wrong kind of idea to have about the way that we, we work in the 21st century. So I still don't feel like I'm, I'm answering your question though. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else wants to, wants to uh, take a stab at that. <clears throat> Sometimes I have to hear it voiced in a different set of words and then I get it. You want to rearticulate her question? Okay. Maybe, maybe this will spark something. Really I'm going to see if I can get a noble savage picture up here, though. I don't know. I don't know. There isn't really, is there? Go ahead. Well, I, yeah, I was just thinking about... Um, that one. I, I, That's the noble savage, the vanishing American, right? Oh, uh, right. He's, he's about to die on his horseback. He's giving himself up to the, to the elements or civilization or whatever. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I guess in opposition to that vanishing American uh, trope. Um, you, you talked about indigenous resistances, resurgences, and um, I, I really liked how, how you're destabilizing this kind of modernist dichotomy of life and death. And it, it reminded me of, of a, a quote from um, uh, Dene scholar Glenn Coltard. Hey, Glenn, yep. Um, exactly how it goes, but something like for our indigenous nations to live, capitalism must die, and then sort of the converse of that for capitalism to die, our indigenous, indigenous nations must thrive. Mm -hmm. Something about this kind of uh, need for like a intersection of, um, of decolonizing indigenous insurgences and resurgences mm -hmm. along with anti-capitalist movements. Yeah. So, and Canadian thinkers are better about this, right? I think about thinking about the role of indigenous people in the survival of humanity broadly. I think they do a better job of that than we in the United States do. And Glenn is, is from at UBC, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so, so, so I was just wondering if, if you could maybe tease out some um, relations between that, that sort of uh, broader view of, of, of resistance uh, with, with Don't ask me to talk about Marx or capitalism. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <laughs> but but I, was, I was just wondering, maybe thinking about Idle No More, mm -hmm. um, which she brought up before, and, and I'm just wondering how um, that, that sort of more uh, overt, active uh, resistance to um, 
land dispossession to um, extractive industries, how, how you see that as relating with um, re resistance to uh, this cr uh, cryo cryopreservation as this deanimating um, deanimating of indigenous lives, um, and, and, if, and maybe get, getting back to, to that quote is. Do, is there a tension between um, maybe kind of essentialist uses of, of dichotomies like life versus death for purposes of resistance? Um, with Would it be strategic to invoke life versus death? Yeah. yeah. Is that intention with, with this kind of uh, destabilizing of, the, of that binary that, that you see in indigenous modes of thinking. So you should stay up here because I'll probably have to ask you to repeat parts of that. <laughs> so the first one was the relationship of cryopreservation um, and that narrative of life and death and the di and then land issues, right? Yeah, just re re relating um, re resistance to, to cryopreservation with other kinds of... Well, and resistance. cryopreservation and the preservation and sampling and maintenance of indigenous biologicals e People have really, indigenous people have really resisted um, the vanishing native narrative that's at the heart of all of that and the way that ha that happens. But you've also got indigenous managed biobanks cropping up. You've got native people becoming scientists. I have an ethnographic project where I interview Native American scientists um, who are, it's fascinating, who are really interested in the biology, um, but are also very, and, and are, are concerned about the role of science and indigenous governance. And so in, native people are able to, at least the ones that I engage with are able to sort of um, hold in two hands these sort of um, different types of projects or, or competing agendas. But w what they're really resisting is the characterization of us as, as in the past, the characterization of us as dead, the characterization of us as, as, as completely without agency. Because if, if you characterize people like that and you don't, you don't see them, you unsee them, then you are precluding, making it very difficult for them to, to to take agency in these kinds of um, activities, so I don't I don't know how that um, I have to think about how that articulates with the sort of land-based stuff. I mean, I see it's really interesting for me. One of the reasons I'm so intrigued with Idle No More is because they are again, as I said earlier, putting indigenous people at the center, and they're relating very much the Canada's violation of treaty rights. To the, to the violation by extractive industries of the land, and they're very clear that these two things are going hand in hand. And so you have to, you have to defend, they're saying to Canadians, you have to defend our treaty rights. Because if you don't, you're gonna end up with this ravaged landscape and no Canadians are gonna be able to live within that. So our survival is part of your survival. Um, and so there, that's very much a, we are not dead and vanishing, right? But our, I guess I haven't thought about this in relationship to the animacy stuff, but if you increase the, the, the vitality and the animacy of indigenous people, that's gonna go hand in hand with, with, with uh, accounting for the greater animacy of non-humans and, and of Canadians more broadly. Um, I just think what, I think what they're doing is really theoretically profound. Um, and they don't talk about it in that way, um, but it's really, a, it's really a model, and I don't think, we just don't do that down here. We tend to talk about treaty rights as this separate kind of legal thing. One of my main critiques of Native Studies in the United States, and why I get so frustrated with it, it's really dominated by lit crit people and historians. And we need those things. I mean, I really need historians of science, for example. I couldn't do my work without them, but we, we don't have people in the academy for the most part, dealing with land-based issues, dealing with materiality, you know, um, and how are we going to produce knowledge that's serving what, what land-based indigenous peoples are struggling with if we're not engaging with that, you know, if we're so, solely focused on narrative, and I think I've shown that narrative matters, you know, it shapes the world and the world pushes back and shapes it, but you can't only focus on narrative without focusing, without getting into the materiality of things. And, and part of that includes dealing with science, you know, and, um, and again, I do research with native scientists that shows that people can come out of land, by the way, the native scientists that I interview, this was a shock to me, they, they are almost without exception land-based indigenous people. Whereas when I go to Native American and Indigenous Studies, and I was just did a three-year stint on council of that organization, so I know the field well in the United States, it is 
for the most part, not land-based people, but it's diasporic indigenous people, and that's fascinating to me. So why are the diasporic indigenous people all over in the humanities, and the land-based native people are, are all off in the hard sciences? I did not expect that, and I think it's because they, were, they grew up on the land, they were hunting, they were taking care of animals, they had interaction with plants, they got interested in cellular things. And paradoxically, then they have access to, to medicine people and to those sort of traditional spiritual forms of knowledge. And so here they have access to all of these things, material and immaterial. And then they move into the academy and they, 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 they have no trouble balancing this worldview and this scientific or evolutionary worldview and they don't worry that they don't reconcile. And, and this is one of the things that I think is so amazing about North American indigenous people, at least all the ones I've worked with, that we come from these non-proselytizing backgrounds in which you can hold irreconcilable forms of knowledge, one in each hand, and you just figure, well, I'll figure it out someday, or maybe I won't, but I'm just a human, so I'm not gonna know everything. And that doesn't inhibit you from trying to learn more, but you accept that you're not gonna know everything, and that's okay. Um, there's a real uh, non, that's a real non-violent kind of approach to understanding the world, I think. And I, that's one of the things I think we have to offer the Western Academy. Um, and it would help us stop competing over whose, whose methods and approaches are better. They all offer incisive ways to get some forms of knowledge and all of our methods and approaches and disciplines are also imperfect and have shortcomings. Do I sound like a Pollyanna here? I probably do, but I've learned this from those Native American scientists, so I probably didn't answer your question. No, you didn't answer. <laughs> I actually just wanted to ask you just about this idle no more uh, thing as um, you know a, a force that's bringing um, a, an indigenous metaphysic of land and landscape into the Canadian public and federal consciousness, mm -hmm. um, and I guess as part of the antidote to the, the death narrative, right? Um, I've heard some Native scholars actually critique things like idle no more as you know, j just for this kind of bringing uh, a pan-Indian metaphysic mm -hmm. more into public consciousness and saying, look, this is exactly part of what's causing the deaths of our individual cultures by taking the focus off of or de-privileging, you know, specific tribal relationships to specific landforms, specific covenants given at those specific places, specific moral charters. And I wonder if you have any yep. sympathy with that or how you would respond to that. You know, I haven't heard that, but I guess I'm not surprised. Um, I'm teaching an indigenizing queer theory course to undergrads this spring, and it occurred to me this last week in our two-spirit unit that the term two-spirit is kind of like the term indigenous. So for those of you that don't know, two-spirit is a term coined in 1990 in a meeting of LGBTQ people in Winnipeg. And the whole idea is that, uh, so it's, it's coming from, I think, um, I think they said it was an Algonquin term. It sounded Anishinaabe to me. I don't know if, is that an, I'm not a linguist. Is that an Algonquin language? Anyway, it sounds like an Anishinaabe word that what two spirits translated from. But they chose this word, this sort of group of multi-tribal native people who met in 1990 uh, to say, you know, it's, it's two spirit is about coming into a community. And they were um, having conversations about all these third gender and multiple gender traditions and multiple indigenous peoples, cultures across the North America. And, but what it was intended to do, it was pushing back against the anthropological notion of Burdash, which was this very pan kind of native uh, tool of colonial anthropology to understand third genders and in indigenous cultures. Um, but they were very clear that while there were many multi-tribal people buying into the tomb two spirit, and I think this is applicable to early indigenous movement as well, they were conscious that that was helping them come together as as people with a similar kind of identity or, identity or predicament in a settler colonial society. So they were articulating themselves as two-spirit in relationship to settler sexuality. But they recognized that they had different gender configurations and different sets of sexual practices in their own tribal cultures. And so they were not trying to erase that, they, but they were proceeding with this collective two-spirit project while keeping in mind that that's, that's helping them organize, but they're not leaving behind their own cultures, and, and one of the other projects of Two Spirit was to, they were not so much interested in getting equal access to mainstream LGBTQ culture. They wanted, they wanted to be full members in their own indigenous nations, and they wanted to push back against homophobia in, in their, th th that's the nation they were concerned with belonging to, not the settler colonial state. And so I think it, it shares something with indigeneity, right? And so my, again, my long answer to your question is, I understand those kinds of critiques, but I think, again, this is the importance of land-based peoples having a voice in doing this work because we will remember 
and we will continue to occupy and stay connected with those land-based cultures while also organizing internationally or sharing lessons through these kinds of pan-native conceptual frameworks or organizational frameworks. But if you don't have that land-based community to return to, all you have is this other thing. And I just don't think that's enough. And this is part of my problem with indigeneity as a framework. I worry that we're moving. It's becoming so powerful and so, so strategic and so useful. But if we cut that off from the, the, the particular placeness of land-based peoples, I think that's a danger. And it's, it's quickly becoming too porous to be useful, I think. And I wonder in 10 years if it's just going to be a concept that's going to be too problematic for us to use. So. So yeah, I don't think, it, I don't know more is doing that. I think they're doing, they're, they're good. They go around Canada and they have these particular community-based actions. Um, and they've got, they've got uh, First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people from around Canada. They're very active as activists within this group. So I, I don't think it's, it looks pan-native, but it's got those ties. Hi, um, so you mentioned, um, you made some remarks at the beginning about working within the academy and also highlighted a binary I haven't heard touched or contested much this weekend, which is this knowing belief binary and how it's used as discrediting language. Yeah. Um, but it also seems that judgment is inherent to the academic project. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your take on objectivity in conversation with the feminist critique of science and strong objectivity and riff a little bit more on your thinking about this knowing belief binary. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I, I teach an undergraduate course called Indigenous Nature Cultures and I'll tell my students, I'll catch myself, I'll catch myself trying not to use the word believe, right? And remembering to, to use the word know. Um, it's really hard for us to, even for somebody like me who's so invested in, in breaking down that idea, um, it's hard for me to stop using those words, but I, I do always go back back to, to Paul Nadezhdi and his, he's got this ethnography of hunters and bureaucrats and he's spending time with um, Kluwani First Nation people in the Yukon and he talks about learning how to, learning how to hunt and, and um, coming to see by being out on the land and, and, and hunting himself how an animal that he had hunted, he, there's no other way he could explain it but that that animal gave itself to him. And, and it, he had to go through that process before he could talk about I know that versus they believe that. And he does a really good job through that ethnography of, of showing um, how we can come to that. And he talks about the, the fact that, you know, so many anthropologists will spend so much time in a community, right, and they still are operating according to this knowing belief divide. Um, I don't know what other way to get around that except to actually fully, I, mean, I hate to sound like an anthropologist, right, but to fully immerse yourself in that community. Um, but that doesn't really get at the, the feminist objectivity part. Um, I know I think a lot about this. I'm trying to think about how to coherently answer this question. Uh, I mean, I'll just talk about, um, I was talking to, uh, oh, I know what it was. I was talking to Chaya, is that how I said, in today in the car, and I was explaining my, my, my worry about indigeneity, um, and this, this kind of related to feminist objectivity. When I, and again, when I talk about in, indigenous people and the things that we know and the things that we do, I'm thinking about us perpetually becoming, right? And that's a part of us being alive. We're always perpetually becoming and we're becoming in concert with the settler colonial state. So that in part conditions who we are. Um, when I do this work, um, I think I'm not interested in, in getting a snapshot. I think this will answer your question. I'm not interested in getting a snapshot of what's out there in Indian country or indigenous communities. That's not the kind of research that I do. And I worried for a long time when I was first starting the Native American DNA research about I'm not objective enough, even though I was trained by a couple of, you know, very well-known feminist objectivity people, Donna Haraway and then informally Sandra Harding. I still took me a long time to figure out what that meant in terms of my own work. And I realized that, um, I'm much more invested in standing with the community and speaking in concert with them and then adapting my research agenda and my questions in, in concert with the, the actions that they undertake, the lives that they are already acting out. And if I am standing with that community and in that community, 
I am living my life along with them in a sense. And so then what, what you get is not a snapshot of what people think. And I took these lessons to my work with, with scientists as well. I don't just go into those communities and say, I want to know what you think, and I'm going to write it down, and then I'm going to publish an article with a quote. I actually want to have a conversation that furthers thinking, that changes thinking, that changes approaches and changes those communities. And then I write about that process as I go along. Um, so I, I have no qualms about standing here and saying, this is how feminist objectivity works, right? I'm, I'm interested in, in marginalized standpoints, but I'm also interested in shifting and changing and crafting new standpoints from even others who might be considered dominant. Um, so, and then you can still come out with an account of what's happening in a very rigorous account, but I think that account becomes more rigorous if you do it in conversation and if you document the shifts in knowledge, right? I don't know if I'm answering your question, but this is what feminist objectivity has done for me in my own work. This is how I have sort of digested it. Um, and then what you know and what you believe kind of collapses, right? I mean, maybe you can turn into action and knowledge what you believe to be true and maybe not. I don't know, I think that, I'm gonna have to write about this. <laughs> To, to make some sense of it, but because I'm still I'm still thinking through this a lot. I was uh, telling somebody earlier we we don't yet have the words I think for working. We've got community-based participatory research, but that's not what I'm talking about. We don't yet have the words methodologically for working in this way because we are still so beholden to a researcher researched binary and that term giving back right that we talked about in the feminist roundtable today. That that's a that's a laudable thing, but giving back presumes a fence between researcher and research, and we've got to find other kinds of languages and concepts for, for dismantling that so we can stand with one another and articulate common research questions or common knowledge projects. And I think this field is better situated than anthropology, frankly, to do that, because I think people are engaging with theory, they're engaging with materiality, they're engaging with policy, they're engaging uh, with projects on the ground, right? And so, so it's probably very fertile ground for enacting feminist objectivity in that way. Thanks so much. This is such a pleasure to oh. think with you, uh, oh, well. in both the question and answer and the in the talk. So, I had a couple of questions exactly following up on your your point with um, thinking through terms. So there was two that I was hoping you would elaborate on, um, particularly the the your fear that indigeneity is going to lose its traction, mm -hmm. and so it's just for me inviting the question, what about it? Like, who are you thinking is, is doing that? Oh, without naming names, I suppose. Well, maybe naming names, but, but without getting anyone into trouble. Uh, and the second one was the, the ideas behind um, uh, the non-human. You know, since uh, the non-human is, is for us um, a placeholder for talking about uh, relationalities with all kinds of others. And so, you know, like we're, like new materialisms isn't delivering it, right? Uh, animacies isn't delivering it. So I'm wondering, when we talk about, when you talk about Pipestone, there's something very specific in, to it. And I'm wondering if, if there's another term or other terms that you know, you're, you're thinking through. Besides non-human? Yeah. It's such a terrible word, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted your thoughts on it. Thanks. Um, so I'll start with that one first. I, I mean, I think about that. You know, I wish, I wish, I really lament in doing this work that we have so few native language speakers. I mean, by having English imposed so brutally, we have lost so much knowledge. And so when I go back to the Pipestone film, it's a really great film, I should have had a clip of it. Uh, Albert Whitehat, who was uh, probably the most fluent speaker in my tribe, Sisseton Wapitan Oyate, he just passed away. And Albert talks in that film, and I hadn't caught this before, the whole time I was growing up, uh, the term um, Wakantanka is translated as, I think, great spirit, or that's not what it means. When he's talking about that, he's talking about relations. Um, and so when I, when I saw this, I thought, oh my God, here we are talking about great spirit and, this, and, and the sacred, and this is what I grew up with. Oh, that's sacred, this is sacred. That, when I began to take Dakota language classes and I, and I heard the language, it just blows your mind. I mean, there are, 
there are concepts you just can't, English is so Christian. I don't know if it is everywhere, but it's very Christian in the United States. And I realize this when I teach in Japan, I can't even have a conversation with my Japanese students about Vine Deloria because I've got to go through frickin' Christianity and they don't get it, most of them. You know, and so we can't even, I can't even have a conversation except through the colonizer. You know, there's got to be these white Christian colonizers out there for me to have a conversation with Tokyo students. And that really pisses me off, you know. Um, and so, I, you know, thinking about if we had our languages, and some native people do, um, there are some Navajo people doing some incredible work um, articulating scientific terms into Navajo because they are one of the tribes in the United States where you see a lot of Navajo speakers. When I go to the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native American Science, I see a group of Navajo people speaking Diné, and that is just amazing to me. At a scientific meeting, most of us in this country can't do that. And so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that as we do language rejuvenation on our reservations that we can begin to tackle some of these topics and within the language there are concepts that we can use um, to get beyond the language of the non-human because I know as far as I can see with my limited knowledge we do have a language of relationality um, in which these other beings are in imperfect English persons, um, not human persons but persons, whatever that means. And so that's, as an indigenous person, that's one of the ways in which I'm hopeful. Now, I don't know what the academy does, you know, but I feel like if we can have these conversations more and we have more indigenous people in the academy, eventually maybe we'll get to a point where we'll have a more complex set of languages. And I think it's really exciting, actually, that we're at a place, theoretically, where there are people who are willing to come to the table and have a conversation and view indigenous people as legitimate interlocutors, right? And not just people that they, that they study as this sort of vanishing little object. And then to get to the, the indigeneity, so um, why do I say I think it's going to lose traction? I just, you know, it's, comp it's, it's getting complicated enough in the United States and Canada. When I teach about I indigenous politics, I don't touch Africa. I don't touch Asia. I mean, very, it's because I can imagine it's so complicated on the ground, right? Because they're not settler colonial state uh, landscapes in the way that uh, North America, north of Mexico is. Um, the way that Australia is, the way that New Zealand is. So when I teach indigeneity, I'm looking at those former British Commonwealth countries, those four, because that's where it makes the most sense, at least as far as I know. And even there, and even in these places, it becomes um, very porous and slippery, again, because of this move to individualize indigeneity, and that is not what it's about. It needs to be about collectivity. That's the kind of struggles that I'm concerned with, but we are such an individualistic place. Um, and that includes Native people. I mean, how could we not be, right? Again, that would to deny the fact of colonization. It becomes about this individual sort of who am I, where do I come from, this very individual U.S. American project. And that is, I think that's just creating a, a predicament for this category uh, that I, I think isn't going to work over the long term. Um, I don't know what else, and I see that in, in Native American and Indigenous studies as well. I mean, really, it seems to me like 50% of the work is about identity. And I guess that's problematic, and I know this sounds really bad, but colonization means that, that certain people with indigenous ancestry are not who their ancestors were, right? And I don't think there's some automatic re reclaiming or entitlement or right that happens because you have an ancestor that was indigenous. Just like, I have ancestry in France. Why the hell should the French care about that? Who cares? Right? I mean, I was constituted as a Dakota person in relationship to that place and my other human relations there, not, you know. Um, and so I just, I, I worry that it's becoming an indigenous studies from my North American perspective. That's what it's becoming. And it can account then for, for example, the, I, I, were, I have friends that work in Appalachia. And I'm struck by um, the knowledge that some communities, that some mountain people have, right, um, of, of like the forest being their medicine cabinet and, and spending a lot of time in that place for generations and, and having this relationship with that land and that place that some diasporic indigenous people don't have. Well, but indigeneity is a really important anti-colonial framework. We can't just let anybody claim it. It's just going to be, I feel like it's going to become kind of meaningless um, because it can't account, it's not accounting as much for the land-based stuff. Um, and it's becoming too much about individuality and ancestry. And that's, ancestry is only one part of it. Does that answer? Okay. And I won't name names. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's about all the time that we have uh, for questions for Dr. Tallbear. So let's thank her again, please. Thank you.